to start we are live hello good evening everyone uh, uh, it's a great pleasure to welcome you all uh, for this exciting webinar in the management of renal cell carcinoma in numenarium excellent weather we carry the greetings from the pink city and it's a pleasure to welcome and invite uh, dr deepa gupta sir uh, dr deepa gupta is a senior consultant in the department of medical oncology at prestigious bhagwan mahavir cancer hospital and research center jaipur uh, good evening uh, dr deepa gupta sir uh, welcome for the session and uh, we request you uh, to take the proceedings for the video welcome and introduction once again good evening and welcome sir over to you thank you tarun ji uh, uh, very good evening to everyone i welcome you all to this meeting on uh, renal cell carcinoma today as you all know uh, march is uh, kidney cancer awareness month also so Uh, for last, uh, I think more than a decade, uh, for ten years or more, we used one or two TKI in the treatment of metastatic RCC. But now, for last four five years, we have many drugs, newer drugs, IO drugs, and newer TKI is also available in various combinations or single agent in first line or second line. So it's a complex scenario now. So what to choose, what not to choose, what to use in first line, what to use in second line. There are multiple. uh many questions which which sometime are difficult to answer so we have planned this meeting to uh answer some of those questions so uh with uh, without wasting further time i will uh, move on to our main session so our first uh, session is by dr asim samar he is consultant medical oncology in bhagwan mahavir cancer hospital is uh, my colleague and uh, he will be speaking on translational medicine in and biomarker relevance in metastatic rcc over to you dr asim thank you boss and uh, at outright and outset i would like to thank dr deepak gupta sir and uh, the organizers for this meeting can i share my screen uh, earlier yes yes sir you can share your slides okay Just wait. I will open in there. Uh, uh, Asim sir, you share the slides or we share? No, no, I share. Okay. This is, I guess, it will move. Yeah. Yes, sir. We can see the slides. Our screen, uh, slide share mode. Pe kar le. Screen is visible. Sir. Okay, so it is moving now. Slides sir, are slide. moving. Slides are moving or not? No, sir. Ah, you have to go below. Ah, us pe na. Ah, wo slide share mode pe kijiye. No, but I have done that slide share mode in my. No, it is. No, no. Okay. Actually, the problem. स्लाइड्स मूव हो रही हैं बट नॉट इन स्लाइड शो वही हर बार हो जाता है सर के स्लाइड शो बस आप अब आप यहां पे क्लिक कीजिए आपने बिल्कुल सही जगह क्लिक किया अब क्लिक कीजिए उस पॉइंट पे जहां पे रखा है ना कर्सर ये हां नहीं ये कि अब वो मेरे में तो हो रहा है इट इज मूविंग इन माय कंप्यूटर बट इट्स नॉट इन योर नहीं ऐसा नहीं होगा आप इसको सर दोबारा से आ जाइए अब इट विल टेक अ मिनट आप स्टॉप करें और दोबारा से आए कई बार हैंग हो जाता है स्टॉप द स्लाइड हां अगेन Uh, I'm sure that your slides open. Hey, just uh, do us share, sir. Again, it will take a minute. Yeah, but we need is a Microsoft Office. I guess is me. Can I put that? This is the share button. Right. Is it moving now? No. No, sir. So, can I share your slide? You you can share that. Huh? Yeah, sure. But in, generally, it happens. So no you problem. share my presentation, which I have mailed you, right? Because uh, there was very lengthy presentation. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I have only twenty five slides. So slides are in front of you. You just have to say slide number next slide. That's it. please please start. Sir. Please. Okay, so uh, thank you, Dr. Deepak Gupta, sir. 
and uh, thanks to mr tarun to uh, organize this meeting so we'll have a discussion in this uh, particular topic relevance of biomarkers in rcc so please move slide yeah so rcc renal cell cancer constitute about 3 to 4 percent of all cancer globally and uh, it's a very heterogeneous disease though it's look like uh, simple renal cell cancer but it has a various histological patterns and nowadays there are some molecular changes also discovered in the larger labs so it is very heterogeneous disease and the results are also very heterogeneous mm, diverse histology histomorphology new entities being added difficult in correct diagnosis and we should have a very good uh, pathological lab histopathology lab and molecular lab for diagnosis of correct pattern of the uh, rcc very varied biological behavior several clinical types and lab based uh, methods are there and there are some risk modelers and dubious performance C index means like the observational uh, difficulties are also there of the pathologist and oncogenic addiction uh, also discovered. Sometimes the RCC may be driven by the angiogenesis module, sometimes it is immunogenic inhibition and sometimes it's metabolic also. Some enzyme deficiency is also uh, discovered in this RCC. So can these be used as a targeting therapy? Next. So RCC, uh, uh, are there any biomarker that can improve the diagnosis? Yes, there are some. And can the performance of clinical or routine lab risk, uh, best risk models be strengthened by the addition of the molecular biomarkers? Yes, the progress has happened uh, uh, many parts of the world and now they are from the bench to bedside. And can biomarker help in selection of the therapy? Yes, we will see in this discussion. So next. So this is the ladder pattern uh, where we move from this pattern to this pattern. So uh, in 1993 to 2001, the, the major focus of the renal cell cancer histology and the treatment was VHL, loss of function mutations. So it was the major discovery happened in 1993. And then it uh, the treatment revolved around this uh, VHL lo uh, loss of function mutation. In 2001 and 2013, this 10 to 13 years, this was the addition genetic alteration discovered in the RCC. You can see like uh, 3P uh, loss of heterozygosity, VHL, 8Q loss of heterozygosity, then TCEB gene mutations, PBRM, now it is it's very important, BAP1 and set 2 So, and now 2016, WHO has given the molecular classification of the RCC and you can just uh, move. Yeah, so RCC clearly divided nowadays in the two patterns, clear cell RCC 75% cases and non-clear cell RCC constitute about 25%. In non-clear cell RCC, we divide into the major part or major chunk is of papillary RCC, papillary non-clear cell RCC. It is of four variant, type one, type two, HPC and oncocytic genes. So it is of four types. Chromophobe RCC constitute 5% of non-clear cell RCC and others are maybe the various uh, mutation related folliculin gene loss, SDS deficiency, succinate dehydrogenase deficiency, fumarate hydrogenase deficiency and uh, micro translocation uh, deficiencies TCB1 and ELK rearrange RCC. So uh, usually uh, we get to know like ELK rearrange are majorly responsible for the Adenocarcinoma of lung, in some part, some, some settings of the RCC, ELK rearrangement is also um, discovered and they are responding to the ELK directed therapies, maybe crejotinib and alectinib. Next. So this is the uh, thing they have correlated, like this, this for follicular, folliculin gene loss and SDS deficiency are related with the chromophobe RCC and formulate hydro, hydrogenase deficiency and micro TF deficiencies are seen in two types, type two uh, papillary, which makes it very aggressive. And here is clear cell RCC in some pattern. And there are two mutations which may be found in the clear cell RCC also. Next. So uh, again, uh, 2012 to 2018, what happened with this molecular uh, genomics? RCC, even with the same morphology or different disease, evolving through different molecular pathways, different genetic and epigenetic alterations. So any alteration happens in the genomic levels, which gives the different uh, pattern of the disease spread, different uh, prognosis, different response to the therapies, and from which therapy it will respond. 
it is very uh, difficult to say. In 2016 or 19, suddenly the everything goes in favor of the immunogenicity of the tumor. Tumor immunity and microenvironment was the major focus of the scientists, and they discovered in and out uh, uh, immunotherapies, genomic uh, genomics correlate immunity, gene, genetic alteration to redefine response to immune checkpoint inhibitors. And this was the era of these immunotherapies, and we are uh, using left and right. Then 2020, uh, this biomarkers, uh, they discovered some biomarkers, which is what many are useful, but none is fully uh, validated because the data are very, very scarce. And uh, you can see like seldom they are used, but in the reference labs and reference hospitals, like MD Anderson and all that, they do the genomic uh, atlas testing and all that. And if they found some uh, targetable mutation, or some uh, enzyme deficiencies, they usually try to overcome with this newer drugs. Next. So are there biomarkers that can, biomarkers that can improve diagnosis? Yes. Can the performance of clinical and routine lab-based risk model be made more robust by addition of the molecule biomarkers? It should be, but not yet they have made. And can biomarkers help in selection of therapy? Yes, we will see later. Next. Next. There are some examples of that. So this is the fumarate dehydrogenase deficiencies of RCC. So this tumor morphologically grossing, they looks very similar. This is the papillary pattern of the RCC. And this, the cells nucleus looks very, very aggressive. So there is no role of observation and early metastasis to the bone happens in this particular variety because it's very aggressive and they will respond well to a specific combination of therapy of bevacizumab and lotinib. And you will be surprised the, the response rate is more than 60 to 80 percent if you target this particular variety with this particular combination. If you use bevacizumab and lotinib in the renal cell cancer to clear cell cancer, Nowadays, we, so we, we will feel like it's a very inferior regimen, but in particular setting, it is very effective and it is the only effective regimen. So finding this fumarate dehydrogen uh, deficiency is, is very, very important if you can find out. And next. So this is an example of how molecular uh, testing is going on. This uh, succinate dehydrogen is uh, B deficiency, deficient RCC. So there are multiple small tumors, limited aggressiveness. There are no, not very aggressive, rarely metastasized. And diagnosis identifying the mutation carrier in the families because it can run into the family. And uh, this one, this is micro TF translocation. There is some new variety mentioned in the WHO classification nowadays. The known as translocation RCC, translocation renal cell cancer. So confirm translocation by break apart fish probes. Of this is of three types: TF EB, TF E3, and TF E amplification. So uh, this some TFE expressing RCC may be ELK rearranged. And we know like we have some good drugs against the ELK rearrangement. And this is the, uh, this rearrangement is, should be checked out by the fish only. Next. So there is one next uh, good paper presented in the, I guess, JCO. No, no, uh, uh, previous one, please. So they have shown if you have find out the uh, ELK rearrangement pattern and you give this electinib, there is a wonderful response in the RCC also. Next. But you need to uh, first suspect and then confirm with the fish. So type of uh, papillary RCC type 1 and type 2. Scroll down, please. Next. And this is the uh, papillary RCC anomas and oncocytic papillary renal cell carcinoma. So uh, we, might, we might think like it is very difficult to diagnose uh, histologically, but what happens is nowadays some uh, ISC patterns are there by which we can di differentiate type 1, type 2 and the other uh, papillary carcinoma. So why it is important is you can see like the, the survival curve is very different in the all four types. Type 2 has a very grave prognosis. And type this oncocytic papillary renal cell carcinoma has a very, very good prognosis, almost five years survival is 100%. And type one is in between, and this anoas is a little bit uh, less than the type one uh, papillary RCC. So, defining the histological pattern based on the IRC is very, very important. We will see in the next slide. Next, please. So this is the slide which can predict, which can show you the how histology and ISC immunohistochemistry is very important. Papillary RCC type 1, papillary RCC type 2, 
ANOAS pattern and the oncocytic pattern. So there they have mentioned on the basis of the three RCC, three ISC pattern. This is the ABC C2, GATA3 and the CA9. This, these three are the ISC markers by which you can differentiate between the all four types. If they are negative, then it is ANOAS, but pattern is papillary. Papillaries are the projections and there are different combinations are there by which you can differentiate between the all four types of the papillary, serous, uh, papillary carcinoma of the RCC. Next. So my message is genomic ISC based uh, on newly recognized biomarkers can establish or redefine diagnosis in five to 10 percent cases of the RCC. Inherited RCC confirmed by appropriate germline testing and there may be mutation carriers in the family members like we have seen, we have said like SDS deficiencies. Papillary RCC can be better diagnosed into prognostically significant categories using the combination of the ABCC2, CA9 and GATA3 ISC markers. Next. Next, please. Yeah. So, what is the putative role of biomarker in prognosis? You, uh, uh, in the basis of the biomarkers, we can divide RCC into the clear cell and papillary RCC. Non clear cell, other variant other than papillary RCC are very, very rare. So, clear cell RCC is VHL inactivation type and role of the other additional gene. Here, uh, we can see like papillary RCC on the molecular basis, it is identifying cap G island methylation phenotype, CIMP RCC or profiling late seven family of the micro RNAs. Next. Next please. Yes. So uh, this is the uh, epigenetic mutation theory. Number of first hit in clear cell RCC and cancer specific survival uh, in this uh, particular model kaplan meier curve. You can see like if uh, patient has a wild type VHL, they have the inferior prognosis. And if patient has an inactivation of the VHL, they have the good prognosis. And uh, other activated mutations are the intermediate prognosis. So finding out them is not difficult nowadays, and we should define the uh, mutation of the VHL gene. Next. So this is again same uh, 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 statement of the other mutations also. VHL inactivation, if you uh, find in cancer like the uh, total cancer genome atlas, so tumor cancer genome atlas, VHL inactivation 52% uh, patient will have. RCC patient will have this VHL, PB, RM1, 30%, BAF1, 10%, SET D2, 12%, and TP50, 2.2%. Next. Next, please. Yes. So, prognostic workup and message in clear cell RCC, BAF1 has a very bad prognosis, localized disease, whether it is localized or metastatic, patient will fare very worse. TP53, bad, uh, uh, they are the bad mutation in each and every cancer. And we don't have any targeted drug against it. And they generally uh, find out in the metastatic state. And if not, then also they will, uh, very early they will be metastasized. PBRM1 has a good prognosis, at least in the metastatic disease. In uh, papillary RCC, there is the absence of immunostaining for CDK and 2A, P16 and FH, fumarate hydrogenase, identifies a subset of the PRC with the CIMP, CIMP appealing prognosis because if they are both are negative, then they have a good prognosis. Expression of the late seven family of the microRNA can separate uh, papillary RCC C1 from papillary RCC CC2. This is RCC2 means this uh, papillary type 2 RCC has a very bad prognosis. But if this uh, particular mRNA is present by P, uh, DNA PC, RNA PCR, you can say like it is a uh, very good prognostic sign. Next, please. Uh, sir, request if you can conclude, sir. Yes, yes, I have one or two more slides. So this is the recent NCCN guideline uh, where you can see uh, this is the based on MSKCC uh, criteria, IMDC criteria. So favorable and uh, poor risk. Nowadays, we are using uh, in and out excitatory pembrolizumab. This has uh, 22 version has some other uh, modifications also. So it is an older one. Next, please. Yeah, and uh, predictive biomarkers for the VEGF targeted therapies. Next, I uh, the immune checkpoint inhibitors have transformed the treatment of uh, clear cell RCC, but a subset respond the need for the predictive biomarker. Which subset will respond? We don't know. Conventional biomarker for ICB largely irrelevant in the clear cell RCC. Response in the clear cell RCC is not dependent on the tumor mutation burden, and it is not dependent on the neoantigens also. 
and uh, this is TIB also does not go with the response. So there should be there we, we should find out the other mutation other markers biomarkers also to predict correctly the response. Next please. Yeah, you can uh, move that side. Next, next, next. Yeah. So around thirty to forty percent patient have alteration in the MET pathway. Trisomy 7, MET, GOF mutations, MET amplification, ligand of the MET, hepatocyte growth factor amplification, and MET inhibitor is a natural choice. Phase 3 severe data of comparing sevolitinib, sevolitinib against sunitinib shown no difference between the median PFOS and has been terminated. Other referred to use MET inhibitor unsuccessful. SWOG 1500 phase 2 trial comparing sunitinib, sevolitinib, cabozantinib, and crizotinib is active and result is awaited, but the interim analysis cabozantinib has uh, taken the lead. Next, please. So this is the, I guess, last slide. PBRM inactivation in the clear cell RCC predict response to VEGF TKIs and immune checkpoint blockade inversely related to the presence of the T effector cell and the deletion 9P23. ICB and VEGF uh, targeted therapies, T effector high and angiogenesis low expressor benefits with the, this uh, VEGF targeted therapy. KDMP, KDM5C is a strong predictive marker for prolonged benefit from the sunitinib. Despite mate alteration being common, no, not been found actionable so far, unlike NSCLC, but nowadays they are saying cabozantinib is useful. It may be useful uh, to test the PBRM buff one set to KDM 5C and TP53 in the clear cell RCC for prognostication and therapy selections. None of these biomarkers has prospective validation to recommend its use. Next. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, organizers. I have overshoot with the time. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Asim, uh, for providing just a meaningful insight on biomarkers in RCC, which is uh, less uh, less uh, uh, known topic and we have very little knowledge about that although most of these things are still i think experimental or not in clinical practice so maybe in uh, <laughs> near future we may use more of biomarkers in this rccs yeah but thank definitely. you very much and please yeah yeah i i learned too yes. much about preparing this presentation most of the concept i have revised or gained first time in the life so it's a good yeah. thing to have set some tough topics also. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Anyways. So thank you very much. And uh, please stay with us uh, for the remaining sessions. Yes, yes. Thank you. So our next session is uh, uh, by Dr. Rajat Bajaj, who is a consultant in medical oncology at Portis Hospital, Noida. He will be speaking on decade of experience with using TK in first line metastatic RCC. Uh, welcome you, Dr. Rajat. Over to you. Good evening, everyone. Am I audible? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I think uh, Mr. Mathur is controlling the slides. Uh, I thank the organizers for having me here and uh, uh, Dr. Deepak especially. Uh, the topic that has been given to me in the next 15 minutes is a decade of experience with using TKIs in first-line metastatic RCC. Uh, the first time that I saw this topic, I thought it's a little different because uh, nowadays, the first time metastatic RCC, the talk is only about IO and uh, IO-based combinations. So uh, is it relevant for us to discuss TKIs? I think certainly yes. And this is what I'll talk about in the next 15 minutes. Next slide, please. So a decade of experience uh, is an important phrase for me. Uh, next slide. And the reason for that is that, uh, of course, we do keep talking about the new that comes up, but then we should always keep the old because uh, the old may not be silver. It may actually be gold. And uh, next slide. If you talk about the word experience, experience is uh, something which teaches us a lot of things in life. And experience is uh, something that just cannot be uh, uh, replaced. And uh, next slide, this is what we really learned yesterday when this man who had all the experience, next slide, uh, told us that, that I am here to stay for another, maybe not five, but 10 years. Uh, next slide, please. 
so at uh, next slide talking about the the uh, rcc in india there are approximately uh, more than 15000 new cases and uh, unfortunately 10000 deaths from rcc new year uh, one third of the patients who are diagnosed for the first time uh, they actually have got advanced or metastatic disease at presentation and uh, very naturally we all agree that these advanced and metastatic cases actually have a poor survival uh, whatever we may do uh, next slide that is why Uh, that is why it is important that we should actually have good armamentarium in us it, as far as the treatment of metastatic rcc is concerned uh, also uh, there is an analogy that we can draw between the covid wave that we had in the <laughs> This this analogy actually is that we've had three waves till now in the last two and a half years. Next slide. So uh, in the in the initial in the initial uh, part of treatment, we in two thousand five we had the TKIs as the RCC treatment uh, most commonly. Uh, then we have the had the IO agents in 2015, and the current wave for the RCC treatment actually is next slide IO plus TKI, which started just like three years back, and it has been like a tsunami where IO plus TKI have taken over in the first line metastatic RCC treatment. Next slide. But having said that, very important for us to understand that this is the evolving front line therapy in metastatic RCC from the last twenty uh, years or so, and we see that uh, initially. the times of interferon alpha and interleukin 2 uh, the tkis started to be developed for this management for the management of this disease from sorafenib to sunitinib in the early 2000s to pazopenib in 2009 to exitinib and cabozantinib initially in the second line and then eventually coming to the first line especially cabozantinib uh, next slide so this is the the tki is that i'm going to focus upon especially sunitinib pazopenib and cabozantinib because i have been told to restrict myself to the first line management of metastatic rcc next slide so uh, as we all agree that imdc or the hen criteria is the way to go in in a patient who's first time diagnosed with metastatic rcc nowadays this is the criteria in front of us we all are aware of these criteria so with a maximum of 6 that the score can be if we can uh, talk about uh, dividing our patients and segregating them into the risk stratification being either favorable intermediate or poor if we talk about favorable then the score has to be strictly zero intermediate is a score of either 1 or 2 and poor risk is 3 or more than 3 this is how we really select our treatment so imdc risk stratification has certainly become predictive of course it is prognostic but it has become pre predictive at least in the last 3 to 4 years now next slide and also very importantly this uh, 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 screen this slide on the screen right now tells us that if we talk about its prognostication then favorable has got maximum uh, overall survival as compared to intermediate which comes the second with a poor uh, risk stratification patients having the least survival out of these three uh, risk stratification domains next slide <coughs> talking about uh, how sunitinib came into being so sunitinib uh, versus interferon alpha in metastatic rcc was the uh, registration trial of sunitinib which was published in negm in 2004 by modzer et al and next slide uh, this trial actually told us and showed that sunitinib was better than interferon alpha in terms of progression free survival which was the primary endpoint of this study uh, the sunitinib arm had a pfs of about 8.5 months whereas the interferon alpha arm arm had a pfs of 5 months with a delta of 3.5 at that time was certainly enough for the us fda to approve sunitinib for the treatment of first line metastatic renal cell carcinoma uh, from 2004 to uh, probably a decade that is uh, till 2014 sunitinib has ruled the roost as far as first line metastatic rcc is concerned uh, the dose of sunitinib and the schedule of sunitinib which was initially in the beginning uh, four weeks on and a two week off uh, all of us know that this schedule nowadays is not very widely followed and the dose now which is followed is a 50 mg once a day Uh, but the schedule is two weeks on and one week off. The in the phase two trial and many retrospective studies, it has been seen that this schedule probably is better tolerated and and has got less of mucositis and less of hand foot syndrome as compared to the four weeks on and two weeks off schedule. Next slide. 
so uh, like like uh, we've discussed that sunitinib is uh, a, 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 has been a major game changer in first line metastatic rcc but in the last 3 to 4 years like i mentioned in my in my uh, opening slides there has been a little so called threat to sunitinib and its uh, supremacy in first line metastatic rcc by coming in of the third wave of the so called rcc treatment agents which is the io plus tki and there are at least 4 to 5 trials uh, which have recommended that as far as the control arm of sunitinib is concerned we have the experimental arm of io plus tki be it with uh, pembrolizumab combination with a tki or nivolumab for that matter which has seen which has shown that the pfs as well as the os in some of the trials is better than sunitinib agreed that point very well taken but then does it really mean that sunitinib has got no value at all i uh, probably no this is not the right thing to say so this is uh, january 2020 where the journal called the oncologist has published this article which is the real static rcc according to the mdc criteria next slide so what they actually did is that their objective was to address this gap in knowledge about the uh, real world assessment of metastatic rcc patients who were given first line sunitinib and according to the imdc prognostic risk grouping next slide and they also wanted to assess whether there is hetero any heterogeneity between this group called the intermediate risk group which is a very interesting thing that they did this is the uh, baseline characteristics of all the patients that they had taken so a little busy slide this but one can see that there were at least 1700 patients that they had taken and nearly one third of them each were there in the favorable intermediate and the poor risk uh, category next slide so what they all wanted to see is that they wanted to see the time to treatment discontinuation they wanted to see the overall uh, survival and they wanted to see the uh, response rates according to the various imdc criteria so the time to treatment discontinuation was the maximum with uh, or, or the longest with favorable risk and the least with the poor risk and intermediate risk was in between the two as the kaplan meier curves here can very well suggest next slide and if you look at the overall survival Uh, the overall survival also was the longest with uh, the good risk as compared to the least with the poor risk if you look at the response rates the response rates were touching about 40% in the favorable risk whereas it was only a meager 20% in the poor risk next slide this is the overall survival i was talking about and one can see that the overall survival in the uh, favorable risk is touching 52 months whereas it is the poor risk it is just a paltry 9.8 months so certainly imdc risk stratification does play a role and very importantly the important message is that if you are talking about favorable risk sunitinib so still is the way to go and it is it can easily be Uh, is a, a player where where one can lay its confidence upon even in the era where we're talking about io plus tki next slide this these are the uh, the next slide is telling us about the heterogeneity between the intermediate risk uh, grouping in this particular article where they said that the intermediate risk grouping can be divided into a one risk factor or a two risk factor and a one risk and a two risk factor if they at all they do this dichotomy becomes even more if you look at the kaplan meier curves where the one risk factor intermediate risk grouping is doing almost similar to the favorable risk if we can one can see this is uh, the kaplan meier curve where we see that almost favorable is is what one can see so this is something which is very important and if it is two risk factor then it becomes akin to the poor risk stratification so we can't hear you so we can't hear you hello hello dr rajat sir hello Yeah, sir, might be some internet issue from his side. Yeah, he's he left. Okay. Hello, Doctor Rajesh sir. Can you join again, please? He's not connected, Tarunji. How he will respond to your query? Yeah, 
and then no problem sir he will join he will join i think he must be joining again yes sir yes sir. yes सर मुझे एक मिनट दीजिए आई विल जस्ट कॉल डॉक्टर राजन या वो मैं भी ये करता हूँ एक बार फोन कर लीजिए हेलो यस एम आई ऑडिबल या 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 सॉरी देर वाज कनेक्शन देर आर सडनली एंड आई कुंट रियली हेल्प इट सो सो आई थिंक वी शुड मूव अहेड नेक्स्ट स्लाइड प्लीज so the real world assessment uh, of the clinical outcomes of first line sunitinib according to this trial told us that in patients who are having a favorable imdc risk grouping they had significantly had a higher os time to treatment discontinuation and response rates compared to patients with intermediate or poor risk with a favorable risk patients having a os of up to 52 months and a cr rates of 6% which was quite overwhelming and in patients who had an intermediate risk with one risk stratification the os touched 35 months which is almost similar to the good risk stratification so sunitinib certainly can be used in patients who have a favorable risk and can also be used in patients who have an intermediate risk with one risk factor next slide please continuing with what we've discussed that is the real world scenario with the use of sunitinib this is the adonis trial which was published in march 2020 in the genito urinary cancer and this is again is a real world experience of sunitinib in treatment of metastatic rcc the clinical outcomes according to the risk stratification next slide so these patients who were given sunitinib well, all patients where the first line use of sunitinib was done and what they actually needed to do and what the objective of this patient was that they uh, evaluated the use of sunitinib according to the imdc and the mskcc risk stratification and analysis of sunitinib efficacy was performed in a subset of patients identified as the risk factor set that means that individuals where the risk factor data was available and again the heterogeneity between the intermediate risk grouping was kind of sought after next slide please so this is the trial methodology where from 2014 to 2019 the patient enrollment was done and uh, the last was may 2019 next slide and the outcome which they wanted to see was the efficacy pfs and os and the safety next slide so it is very interesting that when they looked at uh, the effectiveness of sunitinib uh, by virtue of progression free survival and again by the risk stratification by imdc they found out that the favorable risk group that did the maximum the best with the pfs of touching nearly touching 24 months with the whereas the poor risk was only 5 months the intermediate risk uh, the pfs stood at about 12 months as we can see the kaplan meier curves they are separating in all the three subgroups next slide If you look at the overall survival, same was the picture. OS was the best with a uh, favorable risk and the least with the poor risk, with the p value being highly significant. Next slide. So you need to conclude the discussion. Sure. Next slide. Next slide, please. And this was the uh, efficacy that we saw with, between the PFS and OS, which I just discussed. Next slide. and if it to look at the intermediate one risk to two risk then the if it is intermediate one risk factor then again it was akin to uh, the favorable risk in both pfs and overall survival next slide please <laughs> this is what we have already discussed so intermediate one was certainly more favorable as compared to intermediate two next slide so again the important points to understand is that if it is a favorable risk it is a, a very good scenario and sunitinib works very well if it is intermediate one risk factor sunitinib also works very well and intermediate group is certainly a heterogeneous group next slide we've discussed that next slide 
so this heterogeneous group needs to be further evaluated and further valid valid uh, validation can be done or should be done in a randomized control trial next slide this also is a uh, real world scenario where the heterogeneity of patients with intermediate risk grouping was seen next slide yeah and again the results show that intermediate risk 1 is better than intermediate risk 2 in both pfs and os next slide next slide please very importantly one has to understand that if we talk about the sarcomatoid features especially in checkmate 214 where there were about uh, 60 pa 60 patients uh, who had sarcomatoid features these patients when they were given uh, nivolumab plus ipilimumab they did much better as compared to sunitinib so sunitinib is not for patients who have got sarcomatoid features very important message that should come across next slide and if we talk about the the uh, other trial which is the keynote 426 similar uh, thing was seen that if it is sarcomatoid then sunitinib is not the way to go next slide again uh, very importantly the response to the io or the io plus tk is more in pdl1 positive so should we really uh, see that pdl1 should be a biomarker before we jump on to using ios and reserve the uh, sunitinib as an agent for patients who have got pdl1 less than one expression probably yes and in times to come more uh, uh, further segregation of the data and dissection of data for the io plus tk trials may tell us this thing next slide toxicity as we know is a driver for many treatment decisions in practical scenario tk as we have got a vast experience with io there is little uh, if you talk about the toxicities uh, of tk uh, they are kind of prophylactic measures which we can do and uh, also the incidence and the severity is dose dependent for io it is not next slide now we talk about the last 2 minutes about cabozantinib and pazopenib cabozantinib is another uh, newer tk that has come up initially in the first line and now in the second line which is a uh, vegafenib and next slide we we do know that cabozantinib has been pitched against sunitinib in the first line setting in metastatic rcc uh, in a trial called uh, cabosun trial next slide these are the nccn and the esmo guidelines which recommend that if we have this is certainly this for sunitinib and and if the patient is having an intermediate and a poor risk then cabozantinib is uh, one of the options uh, for these patients next slide and why this one of the options is given is according to this study that is called the cabosun study where intermediate and poor risk patients were randomized to receive either cabozantinib or sunitinib with the pfs being the primary endpoint and os being the secondary endpoint next slide very importantly in this trial both the pfs which is the primary endpoint Uh, like you can see on the screen right now 8.6 versus 5.3 months with a p value being significantly in favor of cabozantinib next slide and the overall survival which was the secondary endpoint again p value being favorable in favor of cabozantinib over sunitinib was met next slide that is why cabozantinib adverse events so they project, were can you please wind up please yes just one minute the cabozantinib yeah. uh, adverse events were just nearly the same next slide so the conclusion is that cabozantinib certainly is one of the options that can be given in t, uh, as a tki in patients with intermediate or poor risk stratification next slide next slide and this is about the compare study next slide about pazopenib pazopenib also is one of the options that can be given we have this trial where uh, pazopenib was compared with sunitinib as a non inferiority trial design next slide and it was found out that this this trial was next slide this trial was a positive trial and pazopenib was found to be equivalent to sunitinib with a non inferiority design so this also is one of the options specially reserved for patients where the performance status is not that good so i think this is my last slide thank you very much my my uh, important take home is that tki is still is an important uh, armamentarium that we have for patients of first line metastatic rcc especially for favorable risk and especially for intermediate risk uh, first uh, risk factor 1 patients thank you uh, thank you dr rajat uh, for detailed insight on uh, use of tkis in first line especially favorable or intermediate one risk group and in the era when everyone is talking about io or io tk combinations i think there is still scope of single agent tki uh, in this era also
thank you very much and uh, our next talk is by dr deepak shukla and uh, he is a consultant in medical oncology at uh, manipal hospital uh, jaipur he will be speaking on role of nivolumab in uh, metastatic rcc uh, over to you dr deepak uh, thank you thank you so much sir and uh, i'll be sharing my uh, slides now so uh, are slides visible is it okay yes it is visible okay so uh, at the onset i'd like to thank dr deepak gupta for giving me opportunity to speak on this topic and also to bms uh, so this is, the topic is an overview of uh, rcc and uh, role of nivolumab in management of uh, rcc so this is the presentation overview so i'll begin with the disease overview uh, which uh, we have discussed mostly in the previous setting so approximately 90% of the kidney cancers are renal cell carcinomas which arise in the tubules the remaining 10% kidney cancers include tcc wilms tumor and renal sarcoma and from our past experience with the reports of spontaneous tumor regression in absence of treatment high level of tumor infiltrating t cells and responses to immunotherapies prolonged responses i must say uh, this is regarded uh, regarded as a immunogenic tumor so before before we go into detail uh, already this has been discussed that rcc predominantly clear cell uh, it is divided into clear cell and non clear cell so clear cell constitute close to 80% while the remaining 15 to 20% are non clear cell histology the disease uh, again uh, a stage uh, like we uh, do for um, most other cancers so uh, coming to the uh, topic in hand that is the metastatic rcc and we'll predominantly discuss the second line uh, setting with the uh, nivolumab as a uh, main uh, uh, overview of uh, nivolumab and uh, the second line so um, approximately 30% of the rcc patients are diagnosed at a metastatic stage and also nearly 20 to 30% of the patients uh, who are initially uh, presenting at an organ confined state uh, develop a relapse um, in form of distant metastasis and most of them are occurring in the initial 12 month period after the local uh, treatment and majority of the relapses do occur uh, in the uh, 3 year time Uh, line and the previous uh, survival reported prior to the widespread use of IO was five year survival in metastatic disease was close to twelve percent and approximately uh, we lose forty percent of our patients with RCC to uh, metastasis. So still uh, metastatic RCC there are a lot of unmet needs. Uh, we need to improve the overall survival. We need to improve the durability of our of the response. improve the safety and the tolerability profile of the available drugs and to improve the quality of life of the uh, patients when uh, cure is uh, not possible so just again um, why uh, io drugs have made uh, a tremendous uh, modification or uh, revolution in the treatment of metastatic rcc so uh, as already mentioned uh, previously also there has been case report series of spontaneous remissions Uh, secondary to immune system in patients with advanced rcc who have not been treated also there is um, evidence to show that immune cell infiltrates and various immune escape mechanisms are at play uh, in rcc and previously prior to uh, the uh, tki era the main drugs were interleukin 2 and interferon alpha and even in uh, at the time of these drugs there were 5% 10% patients who went on to have a, uh, a survival that was uh, well beyond what was accepted so basically it was immune uh, response of the body which uh, went on to control the disease so immuno oncology drugs is an evolving treatment modality encompassing agents designed to direct harness the patient's own immune system and uh, basically the uh, all the alterations in the renal cell carcinoma is for the tumor cells to bring about a micro environment where the cancer cell cells can hide so uh, there is a clear rationale for ntpd1 uh, there are studies showing that uh, in tumor cells uh, close to 25% uh, 
of the clear cell RCC express PDL1 and the patients who are having PDL1 expression in tumor cells, uh, there is a correlation uh, with cancer specific death. The tumor infiltrating lymphocytes are seen uh, to have uh, in more than 50% of the patients have PDL1 expression. And also, the high PDL1 expression on tumor infiltrating lymphocyte is associated with distant metastatic relapse and a poor survival. So, this is the last year's NCCN guideline. In uh, possibly in the US and European country, where widespread use of first line uh, uh, first line IO drugs is very common. Possibly the second line use of immunotherapy. Uh, one may argue in that setting, but in Indian setting, when still um, because of various reasons we are unable to use the first line IO, uh, nivolumab is one of the options. Uh, and also uh, in uh, places where, for whatever reason, it was uh, not used, possibly due to favorable histology or other reason. So, again, this is an option. Also, we have option of cabozantinib, there is an option of nevo EP. Other recommended regimes like exitinib, avrolimus can be used based on the response to uh, prior treatment and bevacizumab, high dose interleukin 2, tamsirolimus, previously more commonly used, are very uh, rarely used nowadays. So, coming to the Checkmate 025 study, this was a randomized open label trial of nivolumab comparing, comparing the then standard avrolimus in subjects with metastatic clear cell RCC who have received one or two prior antiangiogenic treatment and no patients with CNNs METs were allowed, no prior treatment with mTOR inhibitor was allowed and patients who were um, uh, taking more than 10 milligram of prednisone for uh, whatever reason were excluded and the, there were close to 800 patients and they were randomized to nivolumab um, and avrolimus. The study endpoints were the primary endpoint was overall survival, while the secondary endpoint was overall response rate, PFS, adverse event, quality of life, and OS by PDL1 expression. So, if we look into the demographics and baseline characteristics, uh, the majority of the patients were males in the age group of 60 years. Nearly 60% of them were having intermediate and poor risk, and majority have received only one prior line of uh, treatment in 75% of the patients, while nearly close to 25% received uh, more than two anti-angiogenic treatment. And uh, recently, two years back in 2020, uh, the trials, uh, five-year overall survival was reported. Uh, 20, it led, uh, the use of nivolumab used to a 20, uh, led to a 27% reduction in the risk of death as compared to Everolimus. The hazard ratio was 0 0.73. One out of two patients were alive at two years and one out of four patients were alive at five years in their nivolumab treated arm. If we look into the median overall survival, the uh, median overall survival with nivolumab was close to 26 months and in the avrolimus arm it was close to uh, 20 months. And still at uh, five year time point, nearly 26% patients in the nivo arm was, were surviving as compared to 18% in the uh, avrolimus arm. So, if we look into the uh, benefit in terms of OS based on the subgroup analysis, the uh, benefit was seen uh, which was more in the intermediate poor risk, more in the patients who have received one prior anti-angiogenic treatment and the majority of the patients were less than 75, uh, six, uh, the patients less than 75 years derived the maximum benefit. If we look into the OS benefit based on the PDL1 expression, the PDL1 expression, uh, irrespective whether it was more than 1% or less than 1%, there was benefit with the use of uh, nivolumab. Uh, the objective response rate was 23% with the use of nivolumab as compared to 4% with avrolimus, with a odds ratio of close to 6.8 favoring nivolumab. And among the patients who responded to nivolumab treatment, close to 28% had ongoing responses at the time of the uh, last reporting two years uh, back. If we look into the subgroup analysis uh, in terms of uh, the objective responses across the various subgroup, so almost all subgroup uh, derived benefit in terms of objective response. And also patients who have progressed with, within less than six months of prior TKI or have received 
or uh, have progressed after uh, six months, both benefited with a response rate close to 25%. And what is important uh, with IO drugs, which, uh, the, which is the main reason we want to give them is the uh, the uh, duration of uh, responses that we see. So among all the response uh, responders, a treatment-free interval without initiating uh, subsequent therapy was experienced in close to 28% patients in the nevo arm as compared to 6% in the avrolimus arm. If we look into the safety profile, fatigue was the mo most common side effect in both arms. But other than that, uh, except for pruritus, all other side effects were more in the Avrolimus arm and the, um, the uh, nivolumab drug as such was uh, well tolerated. So um, uh, looking into the quality of life, uh, when cure is not possible, this is after well, overall survival, quality of life is the most important uh, concern or parameter which uh, we want to look. So with nivolumab, the quality of life improved over the subsequent uh, follow-up of the trial, while in the Avrolimus arm after initial deterioration and also on subsequent follow-up, there was deterioration in the Avrolimus arm. Uh, this um, Checkmate 25 trial subsequently gave up some data regarding the treatment uh, beyond progression that was published around in 2017. So uh, the patients were uh, uh, in 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 the treatment beyond progression uh, there were in in this subsequent follow up study patients treated beyond progression with nivolumab were close to 153 and patients who were not treated beyond progression were 163 so uh, based on the resist progression subsequently the patient were follow up one group was uh, continued with nivolumab the other group did not uh, receive the nivolumab went on to receive subsequent other treatment if we look into the objective response prior to um, uh, whether the patients continued with nivolumab or were not given, so objective response rate in the population was 20% with uh, patient, in patients who were treated beyond progression, while it was 14% in patients who were not treated beyond progression. And the best overall response prior to this uh, uh, follow-up of uh, nivolumab beyond progression, it was uh, nearly comparable with the uh, slightly more partial responses in the patients who were treated beyond progression. Again, the median time of response was faster in the patients who were uh, uh, treated beyond progression as compared to who were not treated beyond progression. The median duration of response though was slightly lower in the patients treated beyond progression as compared to patients who were not treated beyond progression. And uh, looking into the characteristics of patients who, who were uh, at the time of first progression, so slightly uh, more number of patients were having a good performance status of uh, greater than 90 in uh, who were treated beyond progression. And more patients had improvement uh, at the time of uh, randomization in the treatment beyond progression group. And uh, more number of patients had isolated increase in uh, target lesion in the treatment beyond progression arm. Uh, the uh, other site of new lesions were mostly similar. So if we look into the um, disease characteristics of uh, responses based on the uh, patient, means on the patients who responded versus who did not respond or had a stable disease uh, or progress uh, in the tumor diameter. So close to 20% already discussed the total uh, out of these patients, 13% had tumor reduction more than 30%. So if we look into the uh, patients who benefited uh, beyond progression with a partial response, so uh, uh, many of these patients were having a good performance status as compared to uh, patients who did not benefit and more patients with a favorable uh, group uh, went on to uh, get a partial response. And also patients with uh, the most common site of pre-treatment uh, pre target lesion increase in lung was uh, seen in the treatment uh, with uh, nivolumab beyond progression. So what this trial on subsequent Dr. Deepa, can you please speed up? Yes, sir, just two more slides. So uh, this yeah. trial showed that uh, there was improved overall survival with the treatment beyond progression close to 28 months as compared to not treated beyond progression of 15 months. So uh, nearly 50% had some tumor reduction and majority of them were stable disease and some of them were partial response and the safety profile was similar to what we have previously seen. 
so again um, just the summary slide so um, of data in the second line setting one out of two patients were alive at two years and one out of four patients were alive at five years there was improvement in overall response rate os of 25.8 months with a response rate of 23 percent and there were no, uh, no new safety signals and uh, uh, the nivolumab was actually better tolerated as compared to everolimus and it improved the quality of life of the patients thank you thank you dr deepak uh, any questions okay so uh, if there are no questions we will move to uh, our next session which is uh, by me and it is sponsored by mark so it will be on uh, rcc evolution of uh, our management of rcc in next millennium so i am sharing the slides so uh, very good evening uh, my slides are visible now yes sir okay yeah Great. so this is the timeline of uh, various treatment which were developed in last 20 years and we have already discussed in previous uh, sessions also so our focus will be on this io space which has been more developed in last 2 3 years so there are these are the few pivotal trials in uh, first line uh, very limited uh, responses and limited oral survival as you can see with uh, compass trial bevacizumab cabozentini these are in first line trials so oral response rates are 25 to 30 months or 20 months and median os was somewhere between 18 to 20 months up to 29 months with uh, sunitinib so now when in era of uh, io uh, many io drugs available so there are various uh, different io state the one is the io plus io which is in which was tested in uh, checkmate 214 trial with nivolumab and epilimumab combination and another strategy is io plus tki so various trials are available like javelin renal 101 trial which was avelumab plus exetinib as compared to sunitinib kinot 426 trial with pembrolizumab plus exetinib versus sunitinib checkmate 9 er nivolumab plus cabozentinib or sunitinib and clio trial nivolumab uh, lenvatinib plus uh, pembrolizumab so what's the uh, so it's very difficult uh, because uh, to choose between uh, these various combination so there are few uh, uh, things which we can learn from this presentation that one is the uh, the separation of curves uh, kaplan meier curve so early separation of curves those who have ha uh, large tumor burden and high risk of disease rapid deterioration uh, chances of high rapid deterioration so early separation of curve leads to better uh, their better survival as you can see in these two trials checkmate 214 and javelin trial so there is uh, early separation of pfs curves in javelin trial with avelumab plus exetinib it it starts separating in less than 2 months while in checkmate trial it starts separating around at 6 months so right tk selection is the key in treatment of metastatic rcc along with io so so there are three tkis which has been studied in trials exetinib cabozentinib and lenvatinib so exetinib is an ideal tki to be combined with io in first line treatment of metastatic rcc because it is selective and potent uh, vegf inhibition uh, less unselected off target effect which leads to side effect and longest experience with label dose 5 mg twice a day so in case of combined toxicity short half life of tki would be better to identify in early management of overlapping toxicities so a uh, shorter half life supports therapy management half life of 2.5 to 6.1 hours only and reaches a stable level in the blood within 2 3 days of the initial dose overlapping toxicities of combination strategies short half life tki is better so there are two overlapping toxicities like di diarrhea hepatitis uh, thyroid dysfunction arthritis and rash so uh, in case of toxicity if we stop tki so toxicities improves earlier time to resolution of grade 3 or more adverse event after temporary interruption or discontinuation of exetinib treatment by treatment cohort so you can see that uh, uh, this uh, blue line is for uh, uh, other tkis this uh, pink line is for exetinib plus uh, io and this purple line is for exetinib monotherapy 
in all except this uh, hand foot syndrome all in all other categories the toxicities of excitinib monotherapy or excitinib with io time to re resolution is uh, lesser as compared to other tkis and it is also a highly specific tki with a few off target effect you can see it affects it uh, binds to vgfr 1 2 and 3 and not to other uh, receptors so javelin uh, which is the main topic is the javelin renal, renal 101 trial which was the phase 3 trial investigating first line treatment of avalumab in combination with axitinib versus sunitinib in patient with advanced rcc so treatment naive rcc patient with clear cell component one or more measurable lesion with tumor tissue available for pdl1 testing they were stratified as per ecog performance status in geographic region and uh, uh, there were more than 800 patients randomized to avalumab plus axitinib versus sunitinib primary endpoint pfs and os key secondary endpoint pfs and os in overall population and there were other additional secondary endpoints also like overall response rate time to response and duration of response so it has uh, uh, avalumab plus axitinib has significantly improved pfs with os still not reached in advanced rcc in as per uh, pfs uh, central review it was 13.3 month versus 8 month with sunitinib so there is 31% reduction in risk of disease progression with avalumab plus axitinib and 5.3 month improvement in pfs overall survival is still not mature but uh, curves are uh, curves start separating early so pfs2 uh, in combination avalumab in combination with axitinib demonstrated greater pfs2 in overall population versus sunitinib uh it was uh, 19.4 month with sunitinib versus not stmable with uh, avalumab plus axitinib so 45% reduction in risk of disease progression or death for pfs2 uh, as far as tumor shrinkage is concerned this waterfall plot shows that most of the patient had deeper responses 52% had confirmed overall response rates as compared to 27.3% with sunitinib and median time to response with avalumab was 2.7 month as compared to 4 months with sunitinib treatment related uh, adverse event more or less these treatment related adverse events are comparable or even lesser with uh, 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 with combination so avalumab and axitinib it is uh, longer median pfs in 31% reduction in overall population nearly two time objective response rates lower discontinuation rate consistent pfs benefit across subgroups based on pdl1 status and all prognostic risk groups faster median time to response and lesser higher dose corticosteroid use in avalumab arm so if we compare overall uh, survival across various trials so upper two curves are for avalumab axitinib or pembrolizumab and axitinib which have got highest survival or survival middle curves are for nevo ep combination or uh, uh, this uh, this lower three curves are for uh, sunitinib uh, in various trials so uh, sunitinib has lowest uh, survival uh, oral survival as compared to uh, io tki combination so uh, safety of doublet, uh, doublet arm benefit profile better profile with avalumab plus axitinib you can see that this uh, uh, grade 3 any treatment related adverse event leading to discontinuation is only 3.5% with avalumab plus axitinib and pneumonitis rate is also very low 0.63 and dose reduction is 42.2% as compared to 56% with nivocabo and 67% uh, with len pembrolizumab so it is the one combination which shows consistent efficacy in every this group uh, like in this javelin trial you can see that in oral survival and pfs in both uh, favorable intermediate and poor risk categories they are hazard ratio is uh, in, in favor of avel avelumab plus axitinib pfs also the hazard ratios are uh, in favor of uh, avelumab combination overall response rates are also very high while in other trials they are more effective for intermediate and poor risk as compared to favorable risk group quality of life important before selecting any combination therapy so dose reduction uh, is uh, like you can see the uh, pembro plus lenvatinib 68% nivocabo 56% and uh, pembro axitinib 20% uh, dose reduction were seen because of toxicities so treatment approaches for progressive rcc after one or more 
previous lines of therapy. So these are the second line treatment for advanced or metastatic RCC like nivolumab, immunotherapy based regimens which have IO or IO plus IR, TK combination, then uh, TK based form, uh, therapies like cabozentinib, lenovatinib plus avrolimus, excitinib, avrolimus and other selected treatment like bevacizumab, interleukin-2 and tamsirolimus. So post-TKI therapy in clear, pivotal randomized trial in clear cell RCC, post-TKI, cabozentinib versus avrolimus, nivolumab plus uh, versus avrolimus and lenvatinib plus avrolimus versus avrolimus. So these are the phase two trials and uh, oral response rates are around uh, on the tunes of 20% and with lenvatinib and avrolimus it is 43%, which is the highest in second line and median OS is in uh, around two years uh, after uh, first line failure. Selecting salvage therapy for patient with high volume and rapidly progressive disease on a previous VEGF therapy. So cabozentinib median PFS is 7.4 month as compared to 3.8 month with avrolimus. Lenvatinib plus avrolimus had got a very high PFS of 14.6 month as compared to 5 for 7 month with single agent and nivolumab 4.6 month versus 4.4 months. So cabozentinib or lenvatinib plus avrolimus is a uh, can be reserved for uh, second line or third line treatment options. So there is no clear advantage of any combination over other factors to consider in choosing combination like treatment goals, toxicity profile, frequency of infusions, half-life of TKI, efficacy versus safety, and which options are available for second line in post-progression. So with this, uh, I will conclude my talk. Thank you for your patience listening. I think we are running late, so I think we should move on to uh, panel discussion now. Uh, I will invite Dr. Amit Rothan, who is HOD and Consultant Medical Oncology at Manipal Hospital, uh, Bangalore, and uh, he will moderate the panel discussion. Uh, good evening, Dr. Amit, and welcome. Hi, good evening. The stage is yours now. Please invite your panelists. And right. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, thank you for having me. So uh, I think, uh, let me invite the panelists. Uh, Dr. Chandrakant is there? No, I don't see him. Uh, sir, no, he's not there. Okay. So so then Dr. Deepak is okay. there. Okay, I'm here. <laughs> yeah. So, so I think Dr. Deepak Shikla, Dr. Deepak Gupta, both of us are here. <laughs> and uh, Dr. Varun is here. So that's good. Perfect. I think so. What I'll do is I'll quickly start sharing my slides. Okay. So we've heard the talks, we've heard about all the data sets. What I'll do is quickly how do we apply it in clinical practice? And we'll take it from there. So this is a patient who presented to us some years back, 60-year-old um, male with cough and breathlessness, very breathless actually. And uh, CT thorax showed extensive lung metastasis. A PET scan was done, which showed RCC of the left kidney with lung and bone metastasis. Biopsy showed clear cell RCC. And this is the patient's scan, if you see. That's how bad it was. It was the massive left kidney mass. Look at the lung metastasis. There was hardly any lung. His ECOG was too, uh, he was oxygen dependent. He, he also had anemia and high WBC counts. He comes into a high risk of uh, IMDC. So our first question is, um, I wanted to discuss about the staging, of, I, I mean the, the risk categorization. So what do you do in clinical practice uh, every time when you see a patient? So let's start off, uh, Dr. Deepak Gupta, Dr. Yes, Dr. Amit. Yeah. So, so, so how, how commonly are you comfortable using the IMDC or do you sometimes use the MSKCC? No, I use IMDC only most of the time. Right. Okay. And it's, it's IMDC for everyone and it's a very easy calculation for us. Yeah. Right. So I think all of us are very happy with this. So suppose you have a patient like this, let me. Uh, come to Dr. Deepak. 
uh, Shukla, if you have a patient like this who's coming to you with this kind of a lung and this, what are you thinking of in your mind? So, uh, sir, uh, we have confirmed it with tissue diagnosis uh, when we are saying that it is uh, clear cell RCC because, uh, again, uh, this is a very, uh, means, uh, aggressive presentation for RCC. Um, means I have uh, uncommonly seen it, but uh, see, uh, seeing this picture in a metastatic RCC, my key goals would be to rapidly reduce the disease. So I, whatever I am choosing is uh, for response rates. Right, right. So, so I agree with you. Actually, this is this is not something we routinely see in RCC in our patients. But I kind of remember over years I have seen a group of patients who come like this and who earlier used to just deteriorate off and they would be gone in some months. That's how it used to be in our in our practice earlier. So this is a very interesting case because of that reason. So so as uh, as Deepak mentioned, we always do IMDC. Uh, sometimes I don't agree with these curves which we show on the right side because this is this is the TKIR curve and now the curves would have changed definitely, especially because we are talking of immuno and all the high risk are mostly sarcomatoid and those curves will really jump up, you know. So that's the reason why we say they'll probably change a lot and there's going to be a new publication very soon of the immuno era where they're going to change the uh, the, the the data sets of survival and show us what's the OS with the new uh, IMDC stratification. So that's what we are all waiting for. So again, uh, now Deepak did show us all those decisions of IO, IO, uh, uh, and then the IO TKI talk where we heard about all the pros and cons. So Varun, how are you thinking about in practice these days when you think about IO, IO and IO TKI, where are you placing it in your practice? I, I think you're on mute. Hello? Yes. Yes. Am I audible? Yes, you're audible. Faint, a little bit faint, but audible. So, uh, first of all, as Dr. Deepak Shukla has already told, that uh, uh, in this type of uh, high burden disease, we uh, need fast response first. So, um, uh, in any case, I will use TKI if alone or otherwise with combination of IO. So that depends on IMDC uh, risk certification. If patient is in good risk, it, uh, or this patient is not looking like in good risk, but still, if patient is in good risk, then only TKI. Otherwise, intermediate poor risk, TKI plus IO for this type of presentation. Right. So this kind of presentation, you are clearly saying IO and TKI. Right. Uh, the, Dr. Deepak uh, Gupta. Yes. So, so, so I will, I am this patient so with so high volume of disease and poor performance status, rapid needs rapid response. So I think uh, IO plus TK combination would be the choice. And if you ask about these combination, then I would go for Pembro plus Lenvartanib, which has got uh, highest, I think, response rates. So, so, so you you are favoring uh, pembrol and matinib as your is your regime nowadays. That's that's the way you're yeah. going, right? Okay. Uh, so, so uh, kind of uh, we have all at least we all started with pembrolaxitinib a uh, few years back, <laughs> and now we are we are changed very rapidly. Yeah. I think that's, that's one thing we have seen the responses and the way the curves have changed. Even all of us have moved to lenvatinib based combinations or even cabozantinib based combinations. Even that is a pretty good regime. And that's, I think, I think entering also, yeah. Yes. Correct. I think all of us kind of agree, Exitinib may be a little inferior TKI. It is less toxic, definitely, but it is a little inferior TKI. Uh, I, I, I think this, this IO, IO, Deepak, you mentioned about this in your talk. What patients will you select the IO, IO combination in practice per se? So, to, I think uh, those patients who are uh, favorable or intermediate risk or even poor risk, but don't have disease burden. Uh, much disease burden and those who don't want to take uh, the toxicity of these TKIs. So these are the candidates for this IO IO therapy. And uh, I think uh, they and some there is some chances of maintaining good, uh, especially one important thing about this combination is CR rates. So uh, these high CR rates and even maintaining drug free interval also is possible with this combination. Right. I, I think uh, a couple of points there. One is uh, the CR rate is 11 to 12%. Uh, 
Uh, we used to call it high CR before the pembrolizumab and vatinib data came out. Now yeah. the pembrolizumab and vatinib cause seventeen percent CR. So our our thoughts are suddenly that oh, we can get good CR even with pembrolizumab and vatinib. But but I definitely agree with you. Anyone who doesn't want a TKI toxicity and that's yeah. one thing which makes sense. And secondly, you may have sometimes limited treatment. You know, somewhere you can stop. That's what you keep thinking in your patients. Pembrolizumab and vatinib trials stopped at two years, though the Nevo trials don't stop. But Pembrolizumab trials were all two years trials. So it kind of is is an exciting thought that maybe you can treat for some time and then you can stop. Any any experience? uh uh yeah. deepak shukla about io io do you have you used it in clinical practice and what have been your experiences so sir i have recently used in a patient who actually when he came to me uh, he came after nephrectomy uh, he was uh, diagnosed when he was having weakness somehow at the baseline staging pet he had been at, at that time so uh, he was a 50 year male patient intermediate risk uh, with brain meds so in that patient i have uh, now given nevo ep four cycle he has completed in fact first cycle maintenance nivolumab and his first uh, response is a, a partial response and uh, in spite of using it with steroids for brain meds now after 3 uh, to 4 months all the steroids have been stopped he has he came on a wheelchair uh, now he is able to uh, walk so he means that is Uh, the one experience i am having with nevo ep right. so that's an excellent response when you are talking of brain meds responding did you by any chance uh, out of curiosity did you radiate the brain uh, yes sir on the, means prior to starting any treatment i uh, did uh, irradiation and uh, then uh, i started after radiation i started uh, with nevo ep right now that's that's the way uh, we can see sometimes responses can be tremendously good and the main thing is they may last very long and that's what we are all seeing in practice so that's that's really very uh, very the promise of io io which we keep talking about but i think even the io tki give is is now starting to show durable responses we have seen the pembrolizumab data now for four year follow up so even we have long term follow up for that so i think i think very uh, this all of you have shown that in your all your trials and we've seen that clear sustained response is what we are looking for high response rates and maybe even cr so so our patient this is this is sometime in i think this patient came to us in february 2020 that's a couple of years back he got iotki and this is what happened and in within one month he was off oxygen within two months everything disappeared and he did remarkably well and his quality of life improved he became tremendously uh, he became almost like a fit person you know so we kept doing pet scans and we saw the lung got better and better and we came to a time where the lung did not pick up anything in the pet So, so, so this is how immuno, immuno TKIs can work in our patients, and that's why we don't give up on any RCC patient nowadays. Earlier, it used to be that these patients would have ended up with palliative care sometimes. So, so my question, uh, Dr. Varun, if you have a patient who responds like this, now comes to you, what is your role of cytoreductive nephrectomy? It was not done earlier. Do you would you want to ad- address surgery in this patient? No, I don't think any role now. Like uh, already, patient have responded very well um, uh, at metastatic site. So most likely, uh, renal mass also have been responded. So uh, what the need now? Um, I don't think there is role. Right. I I I think these are very controversial questions. What are your thoughts, Deepak? Uh, uh, I also don't prefer if patient is uh, is responding so well and there is no symptoms because of that renal mass, hematuria, pain or something. Then. i would not prefer uh, nephrectomy okay so any any patient you are doing cytoreductive nephrectomy if they are in in any group patients if they are even if they are not maybe maybe sometimes if uh, front up front sometime patient get nephrectomy maybe they can get it done other centers then come to us but uh, you, after starting treatment if patient is responding well then i don't go for uh, this cytoreductive nephrectomy Right. Okay. If, so if, if during treatment, if we are going for nephrectomy, that uh, maybe it is palliative nephrectomy in view of symptoms. Otherwise, what yeah. is the need? No. So, <laughs> so I think you. I do. I think we can do cytoreductive nephrectomy if, uh, uh, like, uh, more tumor burden is in renal, like uh, kidney mass is uh, big, but uh, metastatic sites are small or less in number. Not simply minimal right? metastatic burden. Yes. So possibly in favorable favorable risk group uh, for in favorable risk group one may discuss uh, when the biology as such is slow but again uh, most of the time these patients come uh, after nephrectomy uh, to medical oncologists so oh, right no i i think uh, all of you have brought out very uh, 
points which we discuss a lot and deliberate a lot in meetings so in the tki era we always said some nephrectomy is good and it always at least we believed it added in survival even if the patient were asymptomatic and that's what we are not able to answer in the immuno era and that is what is cre- creating a lot of confusion but, so, uh, so what what just, we do is what yeah. exactly what uh, you have mentioned deepak shukla what we do is we say if my patient was favorable risk and i treated and they did very well if for any reason i used iotk also i i still am sending them for cytoreductive nephrectomy after a good response still believing maybe because of the long survival there may be an advantage but if a patient is high risk like this patient i i kind of deliberate with the patient maybe we don't have any data saying it will benefit but we don't have we still have some old data saying there may be some benefit so so it's very controversial <laughs> there's a there's a clinical trial now looking at it in a proper fashion where they're giving immunotherapy looking at responses and then doing a randomization between nephrectomy versus no nephrectomy so i think that trial will be the first time we will answer this question in a proper manner whether to do it or not so so very controversial and i agree with all of your thoughts so incidentally this patient i sent for nephrectomy and we did a nephrectomy after one year because it was there was no disease anywhere else but this was a high risk patient and we ended up doing one now so so the other points of discussion i i think uh, varun mentioned this how would you treat your favorable risk patients presently so uh, favorable risk patients we usually treat with tki alone so okay, and, uh, and which tki so uh, i have all three options like uh, uh, like sunitinib pegapenib and uh, cabigentinib now so if pas is poor uh, then uh, in that case pegapenib otherwise sunitinib or cabigentinib uh with cabigentinib my experience uh, till now is not so good because uh, any uh, any of my patient haven't uh, tolerated 60 mg uh, like 40 mg is okay, okay but 60 mg patient doesn't tolerate with sunitinib uh, i have rich experience so uh, still my preference will be sunitinib to start with right so so cabo becomes very controversial because they did not usually use favorable risk in their trial so their first line trial was only for intermediate and high risk patients so whenever we try to extrapolate data from favorable all of us i i, I don't think we are doing wrong i think we are doing justice saying we are doing something better but we don't have data about it so it always becomes an issue but but i agree with you fully favorable risk is one place where we we still say tki has a role but uh, uh, deepak uh, do you do uh, favorable risk patients which patients would you want to give an io to oh okay uh, you're asking deepak, me Yeah. Okay, sir. <laughs> I will no, have no, to keep actually, telling. Actually, most of the time, ah, uh, it is TKI only, and that is ah uh, most of the time sunitinib actually, and which is because we are very very much used to use uh, sunitinib, and uh, some patients, as I I already told you that if someone wants to have some CRs or someone wants to avoid this TKI, then we can use some IO IO combination also. Right. Yeah. So so favorable risk. Uh, io io i think in the long term is going to become useful but as of now at least io io in the favorable risk is a very controversial thing because yeah. uh, because of the 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 way the survival curves are coming out but 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 definitely there are higher crs and probably those will extend the survival but io tki can definitely be an option for your favorable risk patients so so we we in our practice say that even if our favorable patients who have a very high burden of disease sometimes we do get that patient burden is high but they still sit in the favorable risk we definitely talk about io tki to those group of patients and that's the way we keep thinking about right uh, dr deepak shukla do you do any biomarker testing in any of your patients pdl1 or any other biomarkers you think are important Uh, sir so uh, just a point in the previous discussion so possibly in a patient who is having um, low ejection fraction or cardiac issues in that setting when we can not use uh, tki possibly a combination of io with an io uh, is uh, can be used uh, so suppose okay. a patient with ejection fraction okay. of 25% uh, means i have used in one of my patient so uh, that is an option and uh, uh, routinely i am not uh, using any biomarker in uh, rcc right points well taken i think cardiac toxicity with tki if there is and you don't want to you want to avoid a tki completely point well taken i and i you can be uh, considered though though in the ep nevo when it came out especially in the melanoma data we had seen that rare cardiomyopathy and cardiac mortality so that's something that we keep 
getting scared about in the back of the minds but i think is something we don't see this in our uh, data sets where the dose is lesser you know we do 1 3 so it's quite easy and comfortable for most patients right biomarkers uh, no role of pdl1 we don't do it none of us do it that's i think i i, I would fully agree dr varun how long do you give immunotherapy is in your practice so, um as such by uh, recommendation if we go so this should be continued till progression for unacceptable toxicity or financial toxicity so uh, but uh, in one or two of my patient um, i have stopped at two year because patient was uh, in metabolic cr and uh, he was fine so i have stopped but uh, otherwise to continue right so so the, the data for pembro trials are all two years so there it's two years nevo trials do indefinite they don't do two years and that's the difference a little bit from the nevo trials the the we have looked at our patient population of patients who got cr and we have actually stopped much earlier in many patients so we have a pool of patients where all patients who got cr we do scans at repeatedly if they are doing well we stop at one year and we have a good data set there and that's been our personal experience i, I think this was a very just a question uh, do you increase the duration of uh, nevo I means suppose from 14 to 1 months in yes so we we do it a lot we do yes. it a lot yes can two... be done yes so after 6 months or so we do it a lot and that's been our practice but in that case uh, uh, like we have to increase the dose to double so uh, just no. logistic so, issues so, covered so that is that is the ideal way of what you are telling of of what mm-hmm. the recommendation from the guidelines are and from what the us uh, all the registries are and that's how the trials were done uh, i am talking of practically what Pre- i feel Pre- is we we give a lot of immuno which maybe the dose may not be required for many patients so what we do in our patients is after we have got 3 months we are doing very well we do 6 months we are doing very well we actually wrote about this and we sent a paper to asco also where we said after 6 months if your patients are holding very well you can you can you can face it out you really don't need that 2 to 2 weeks and even if you're doing 3 weeks you don't need to keep hiking the dose you can go to 4 weeks and then slowly phase it out and then stop it and we stop off in a year in most patients and we believe we believe we do a lot of immuno more than what is required but but that's the way the study has been done so we can't deny it it is more of financial reasons for our patients that we keep doing lot of various things and it becomes justifiable for our patients but i agree fully as per trials and as per data sets says how it is 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 you should increase the dose if you are increasing the duration so this was very interesting and i wanted to just put this up uh, biomarkers uh, pdl1 is is very prognostic and we have seen this from the T- tki era anyone who has a high pdl1 will actually have a poorer survival from the tki era so that's been seen but now we know if high pdl1 will be will probably be a better response to immuno but we know low pdl1 one will also respond so so pdl1 is interesting but again it's not something that we can use in clinical practice otherwise we will miss our patients tmb again is very controversial no major role tm pbrm is very interesting again but again controversial not for clinical practice we looked at nlr and this is something that we keep saying everyone can do in the rcc you know just look at the nucle- nu- the neutrophil lymphocyte ratio and nlr of I, many people have used 3 some have used 4 some have used 5 but around 4 is what we believe if you see an nlr is going up very easy to do you may actually predict the response to immunotherapy so so if the lymphocytes are going up you know your patients will have a better chance of responding and there are various ways people are looking at this and again this is something that is our own we have our own data sets where we looked at all our patients with immuno who are looking at nlr is a very easy way of trying to even choose patients sometimes so so my belief is if you have a nlr which is very low probably single agent immuno is not going to work very well so if you get high neutrophils and low lymphocytes but if you have a very high nlr sometimes even a single agent io drug may work and whether you know whether you need a combination or not so it's very intriguing people are looking at it in very different ways but yes the problem is you can't use it for clinical decision making as of now so i would encourage everyone to just watch your nlrs when you see when you give we give your patients you know especially in rcc though there is data from all the other cancers also so how do you manage progression i think i think uh, we saw the slides so so uh if first line tki i think very straight forward anyway i think what we'll do is we'll quickly just run through this this way yeah i think this is the best way to do it uh if you gave first line tki i think everyone receives immuno right or do you think of absolutely so the second is if you got an io based doublet of io tki what would you do 
and that's the whole controversy now what do you do nowadays if you got iot ki progression let me start with each one of you uh, dr deepak shukla you uh, so sir again uh, we have already used uh, iot ki so um, means i am assuming that uh, patient responded well or uh, did we have a treatment free interval okay, yeah I, i yeah sorry i didn't tell you this so mm-hmm. maybe let's put two scenarios one patient who did well for a year and then progress and one patient progresses in three months so the uh, person who progressed uh, with the uh, means initial uh, upfront itself three months then definitely uh, any um, other combination possibly um, uh, uh, lenvatinib with evrolimus is an option and what uh, if you had used pembrol and vat in the first line if we have used pembrol and vatinib then uh, uh, again exitinib is uh, one of the option but again i'll uh, be more comfortable with evrolimus in that case possibly a different uh, pathway mtor inhibition right okay okay hmm. uh, dr varun you if you had a patient who gets iotki first line progresses quickly or late so uh, same like uh, if uh, quickly then um this lenvatinib plus mtor inhibitor otherwise if uh, late if i uh, if patient progress even after one year then we can even rechallenge the same combination like we have started the treatment io tki patient uh, uh, responded we have uh, discontinued io and uh, maybe tki have been continued maybe after uh, ex- like uh, maybe gap of uh, nine months one year if patient progress then we may rechallenge with io uh, and uh, but this is very rare scenario so if we have started io tki uh, early progression we should change to len plus mtor otherwise uh, any other tki okay uh, uh, and there is uh, sir just some more data for if a patient has responded to a single agent io uh, possibly nevo in that case so we there is some data from uh, titanic that uh, we can add the uh, epilimumab on progression, on progression. Yeah. so correct that's also yeah, another interesting Uh, Dr. Deepak, uh, your thoughts? If you treated pembrol and vat in the first line, because that's the highest response rate, there's no doubt about it. All of us are tempted for that as first line. Then what do you do? Yeah. So I think then option remains uh, I, uh, single agent TKI like sunitinib or uh, maybe cabozantinib. Okay. Okay. So you, so cabo is definitely something that uh, we can go for and. it becomes a little difficult you know that's that's yeah that's the whole yes. that's the whole dilemma nowadays you know when we keep we keep thinking we are doing the best upfront and when we do upfront it doesn't work and and then we start talking of going backwards to acetinib you know it becomes quite dilemmatic even in our minds will it work really acetinib when you start thinking of that or when you're going back to one of the preliminary drugs uh, it's it's uh, i think rapid progressors will not respond to most of these older generation most people. of these drugs yes correct i think cabozantin may be the only way uh, i struggle with this decision i i like i like cabo nevo as my first line option for this reason that at least lenvatinib and evrolimus is available for me as second line yes and, yes that's also and, because len plus evrolimus is has got very good role in second line absolutely. and many it's a very good response also means patient tolerates also very well if you reduce the doses of lenvatinib little bit and uh, it's a very good combination right i i fully agree with you you know and all of us have very good experience so cabo came very late and last few years we have been using lenvatinib evrolimus and all of us have seen very good success stories so so that is a struggle i wish there was a there was a a different kind of a cabo evrolimus trial which had answered that we can use that combination then it becomes easy for us to switch to that but till now cabo is only single agent in progression so that's a that's a dilemma always so so i think i think uh, we have covered this uh, and uh, this was covered in all the talks so this this was one patient of ours where i wanted to show what happens when you do iotki first we did iotki patient did very well for one year progressed when progressed we got nevo ep as per what you sh- what you shared and we gave four cycles of nevo ep he progressed and in three months he progressed the next can it was progression so till now all my second line nevo ep patients have progressed very rapidly i have not had much responses especially those who have responded to io a long time adding ep i am not very encouraged by only very few patients may respond most may not respond so then we went to lenvat and the weberlimus and he responded very nicely and he is doing very well but toxicity is a major concern i think all of you would be experiencing that what is the dose of lenvat and the weberlimus you use in practice varun Uh, so we usually use uh, len 10 mg and agrolimus um, 2.5 to start with 
and try to uh, go by 5 mg if possible otherwise most of the time 10 and 2.5 okay okay that's that's quite a low dose uh, so yeah i uh, usually use uh, 16 mg len and 5 mg evrolimus right I, I, yeah that's i think that's the way most yeah. of the people do i use 14.5 is what i do uh, okay. and then titrate it up or down there's only a couple of patients where i've been able to give the ideal 185 others everyone has been either in 14 or and and 10 so incidentally there has been there has been a study which they looked at the dosing of lenvatinib in these combinations and, and they said that if you dose lenvatinib less your responses are less so you have to dose them high but it's not a reality you know we can't dose them at that dose what they keep recommending so that study actually said if you dose even 14 and not 18 you are doing an inferior survival they they said clearly your survival is lesser so they said somehow you should start with 18 but it's impossible you know the patients get so sick with 18 so i i kind of think 10 to 14 is fine with us everlimus doesn't need too much of dose reductions in this group of patients they do really well so the last i think i think lastly i will just show you our data uh, this is our last year's asco presentation first line iotki combination from our center uh, we had 22 patients with iotki 12 had received combination of axitinib and then we shifted to lenvatinib so 10 were on lenvatinib we had 13% were favorable 59 intermediate and 27 were poor risk we had crs of 9% we had prs of 59% 68% overall response rates we had three patients who had toxicities were colitis pneumonitis we even had a encephalitis and all these three patients we had to stop the io permanently TKI toxicity definitely is manageable by dose reduction, so that's never been a problem. But this is the response we got, and that's the reason why we are very encouraged. Seventy percent response rate is exactly what you saw from the trial, exactly almost the same response rates. And this is our PFS, and we've also get got a PFS of twenty-two months in at least this this group of small group of twenty-two patients. Even the OS at one year is very good. So we are also kind of saying these combinations clearly, even for our patients, are very effective, and all of us see that in practice now. so i think i think uh, io based combinations are here to stay it's all about using more and more and getting used to the toxicity management so i think with this i will conclude io io or io tki one of them is the way forward uh, except the favoral risk where tki alone is still the way forward for most of our patients second line is getting tougher and tougher and decision making of second line is more intriguing uh, two ways two ways i think the problem comes the problem comes is you spend a, such a huge amount in the first line and then if you don't get response patients hold you responsible that you're not responding after spending that much money so it becomes very very difficult to explain to patients but but definitely we are improving survival of our patients tremendously and there's really no doubt about it so thank you very much yeah it's a wonderful data by your center also dr amit congratulations to you for that and thank it was a uh, really very good discussion on first and second line treatment of uh, metastatic rcc we had uh, discussed tki ios combinations and all so i think uh, with this uh, we uh, we conclude our meeting today and i would thank all the presenters dr asim samar dr rajat bajaj dr deepak shukla uh, dr amit dr varun and dr chandrakant could not join and thank you uh, uh, tarun ji and horizon conference for uh, uh, organizing this meeting so successfully i thank you all again for sparing your valuable time today and looking forward to see you again in near future thank you so thank, thank you uh, dr deepak gupta sir uh, for moderating the entire session and thank you all the faculties uh, sir from all of us from the organizing team my colleagues surbi and everyone we wish you stay safe stay blessed have a nice weekend until then thank you and bye bye thank you bye, -bye. bye. good night everyone bye thank you